and get rid of people's faith. And then all of a sudden they may set up a, their own God, a dictator, and instead of praying to God, they pray to their dictator. Uh, and it was Mao, I think it was, in China. Uh, all the kids in school, when they said their prayer was, thank Reverend, or thank, uh, uh, what it, was he? Chairman Mao? Is that what, Chairman? Yeah, thank Chairman Mao for your food, and thank Chairman Mao for the house over your head. And thank Chairman, and that's what our government, I feel like, wants to do here. It wants everybody to put it on the government so that one day there'll be no God. You'll just say, thank our government, you know, thank the United States for our food and for uh, the roof over our head and for shoes on our feet and so forth and so on. And uh, they'll take the place of God. And then we'll eliminate a lot of problems they believe. Because the only thing that stands between them and evil is us. Get rid of us and you do what you want. So the darkness will rule. Uh, you know, there's nobody standing in the way. You know, drugs will rule. Alcohol will rule. You know, the sex industry will, you know, really blow this thing out. You think it's bad now, wait until the church is gone and uh, see what happens. Then all evils turn. You still have somebody that says, hold it, hold it, hold it. But um, that's going to go away. If the Lord has, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we realized back in uh, verse number 9 where it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And so, once again, we see that confession is made, but you have to believe in your heart. And verse 10 tells you, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. So when, once that heart takes over, then uh, the mouth speaketh. <laughs> so what's in the heart is what comes from the mouth. And you'll confess him. You'll confess him. You'll witness for him. God will give you the power to do so. And you will confess him constantly. You'll, wit you'll become a witness. You'll actually become one of those preachers we're talking about in verse number 15, where when you get an opportunity, you go and, and uh, uh, tell your neighbor or you tell your friend or, or any of those. Now, some people say, well, I don't need a, a planned visitation program because I, I can witness any time I want to, and that is true. But if you don't have a set time to go, you won't go. That's why we have set times to go. That's why we set up visitation programs that we'll say at 11 o'clock on Thursday or we'll say at uh, 7 o'clock on Thursday night or 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. And we can set them up according to our schedules, of course, but you've got to have a schedule. It's got to be on there. It's got to be part of your life or you won't go. It's just like going to church. What if I say, uh, and I hear people say, I don't need to go to church. I worship God on my own. Well, that's fine. Now, how many missionaries do you support on your own? How many people you pray for on your own? How many people do you know on your own? How many uh, other people do you help on your own? You'll find out it's very difficult to do these things on your own and uh, the things that God's ordered us to do. And so we, we have a church because God made the church. He died for the church, and that's his body, and that's who he instructed to win this world, to Christ, and that was through his church. We're supposed to do the work that Christ did when he was here, and that's evangelize the world. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. And I was telling Darlene and Clay about seeing that movie. Nancy and I went uh, yesterday. Yeah, we went yesterday and seen um, Cabarini. And uh, it's a Christian film, and it's really about the Catholic Church. It's about a nun and this nun was a very sickly nun, and uh, and really she was supposed to be dead, but she had a burden in her heart for, for these little orphans, these Italian kids that were being mistreated in New York. Well, before that, though, she wanted to go to China because she said the Chinese, the Eastern people, were forgotten. We have nothing for them. We want to go there and start an orphanage. Well, the whole Catholic Church is forbidder, you know, one thing, the last thing in the world we want is a woman doing something. Good night. Why well, the whole world be against us, you know? He said, once it happens, then all the women are going to think 
they can do it, you know, and, uh, and, and and this stuff and that stuff and so forth and so on. But anyway, this, this little nun, she was very determined, and she would not quit, and she went all the way to the Pope till she convinced the Pope, and the Pope made a deal with her, and I think, you know, that he, just, he, he did that because she had a vision, and he said, well, we're not going to stay in China. <laughs> said, we're going to start there. My vision is for the whole world. You know, we're going to have these everywhere, even in the United States. And that got the Pope's attention because he wanted to get something going in the United States. But anyway, he decided to help her and let her go to the United States, but she had to raise her own money and everything, and she wasn't allowed to ask white people, uh, English people, or any of those people in the United States except Italians for any help. And, buddy, it was very difficult, but she managed to do it. And uh, you just have to see it. She started the first hospital in the United States of America by the church, which was the Catholic Church. And I got to thinking about that. And I was sitting there, and I said, what if she started the hospital that was going to be the hospital I had my heart surgery in, that God seen in the future to keep me alive. Now, I've always said that God has a plan for everybody. <laughs> God has a plan for the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, I always say, they were sit here to feed the world. We were sit here to win them the Lord. So we're here as the guardians of God's Word to protect God's Word and get this Word into the world to get the world to the Word. And that's what we're supposed to do as a church. We're supposed to glorify God in everything we do, and that's why and why you do this brings people to Christ. It lifts Him up so people can look at Him. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So who's going to do the lifting? We are. We're the ones that lift up Christ. We're the ones that's supposed to put Him on that pedestal that the whole world, you know, will desire after Him. And I'm really amazed right now of all the Christian movies that are out and that are coming on TV. And, and, uh, and you might not know it, but look for the title. It says Angel, Angel Studios. And when you see that, it's going to be a good, solid, faith-based movie. And uh, you'll really enjoy, I really enjoy those, and they're really well done nowadays. They're not like the old ones. You know, the old ones, like you said, somebody did that with an 8-millimeter camera and bad glasses, you know. <laughs> but today they're first class, and they got, you know, good stuff in them and, and <clears throat> good sound and good everything, you know. But um, I forgot what I was saying. Oh, talking about this God will deliver you in your confession. But, um, you know, a lot of times I don't think people really have a problem believing. They really have a prob prob problem confessing. And I don't know why that is. You would think if you were really a believer, you wouldn't have any problems confessing. But I've been to so many houses uh, over the years, uh, to uh, soul winning, knocking on doors, where I found people asking God for things. And God said it to them. And, uh, and it's like you knock on someone's door, and I, uh, I can give you a few examples. Uh, one time I knocked on this lady's door in Summerside, and she answered the door. And I told her who I was, and she started bawling. She just fell down on her knees. She said, Preacher, you're not going to believe this. And I was right behind this door praying to ask God to send somebody to explain this to me. I was about out of my mind. And see, God was answering her prayer, and I was being obedient to God. And all I was trying to do is answer God's command for my life to go into all the world and, and preach to every creature. But God was using that to answer her prayer so she could get saved. But it doesn't stop like that. It's like uh, another time I'm in this apartment complex and I knock on the door and this lady comes and says, she is totally wiped out. So high on drugs. I don't know what kind of drugs she was on. And like drugs and alcohol and she's just done for. And I won't give you her last name, but her name was Diane. And uh, she's dead now. 
but that's how I first met her. And she had two little kids, and one of them, um, one of them had a, I don't know if it was muscular dystrophy, cerebral palsy, yeah, cerebral palsy. And the other one was the little cutest little five-year-old girl you ever laid your eyes on. And Dana was about, he was probably four, three or four years old. And or he could have been older, but I know Kelly, the five-year-old, took care of him. And I can't remember exactly. But anyway, I met him. The mom's wiped out. And we go in, I, we start talking to her. She's in her bathrobe. And as we started talking to her, her robe's laying wide open. And so I'm talking to her like this, you know. And Brother Ken, he's with me. Brother Ken's sitting there. He's like this looking at me. I'm looking at Brother Ken. <laughs> and we didn't want to quit sharing because she was so interested, you know. And um, so I went through the whole plan of salvation. And I said, listen, I said, Diane, would you like to pray and ask the Lord to save you? And she said, yes, I would. And I don't even know if she realized what she was saying. But when she started praying, I'm telling you, folks, when we got up off our, off our knees, she was sober as a judge. She had a robe closed. Something changed, just like that. Something changed. And she came and got baptized. And uh, when she died, her boyfriend told me that that was the greatest Christian he ever met and said, if there's ever been anybody any better than her, I'd never met him. And boy, I mean, he gave her a, a testimony that you'd be honored to have anybody there. You see, what God did, God didn't only use me to say, I believe this woman had Jesus in her heart. I believe that she was, you know, had no trouble believing it had been there for a long time. But she had never confessed it. Never confessed it. And so when she made that confession, it made all the difference in the world. Um, and God sent me there, not, not just to lead her to the Lord, but to deliver her. She was delivered from those drugs that was, had her in bondage, that kept her from being a good mother, kept her from being a good Christian, kept her from being anything for God. And so God usually works that out where, you know, he puts these things together. And, and so when you realize that, when you start thinking about the bigger picture, it blows your mind. <laughs> you start putting dots together and see what happens in your life. You go back and try to trace some things that you've been through. You have kids walk up to you. Well, they're not kids anymore. People walk up to you and say, you remember me when I was in your class when I was a kid? And I say, uh, give me a hint. <laughs> you know? uh, oh, yeah, I remember you. You were the rottenest kid I ever seen. <laughs> and you see how God had worked in their life or done something special for them. <clears throat> but um, see, these confessions, <clears throat> I think these confessions are testimonies uh, more than anything, and when you confess, when we have an altar call and we invite people to come down here and pray, the only thing that's about is I believe they, they would have never got out of that bench right there if Christ wasn't in their heart. And when they made their way down here, they had already they'd already been saved, they've already believed, but they've never confessed it. And so now we give them the opportunity to make that confession, and now they got a birth certificate. You see, they remember that date, that day that they confess it. Now they can put a date to it. And it's kind of like these people, uh, you know, born down in the country don't have birth certificates. And they don't, you know, like my mom, she don't, she says some people say I was born in 30, some say, or, or 34, some say 35. I don't know. And uh, she wouldn't know because she didn't have a birth certificate back then, you know. So she didn't know if it was 34 or 35, and a lot of people are like that. And so they just have to pick one of them and go with it. You know, Mom says I'm 34. Uh, Paul says I was 35. So 
I don't know if it's 34 or 35. Um, but if you got a particular date and a particular time where you called and confessed him, then you, you got a date, you got something to go back to. And that's why we give out those little New Testaments. We write in there what the date is. When they have prayed, then uh, <clears throat> sign, let them sign their name in there. So when they're, you know, one day that little testament might be the, it might be all that a person needs to, to relieve their mind and heart from the pain of a child dying. If you haven't never experienced that, it's rough. And nobody expects to die, die before their children, or nobody expects their children to die before they do, but it happens. And I've seen many times where they found that New Testament and it had their name signed in there. And they said, oh, I accept the Lord Jesus Christ on this particular day, signed so-and-so. And boy, that heart just, because they got some hope now that this, this kid made it to heaven. You see, so it's so important, uh, those confessions and the calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, <clears throat> This woman's calling on the Lord for help. Help comes. This woman, I don't know how she's calling on the Lord because the Lord says, even if you don't know what to pray, you know, uh, let the Spirit, He'll do it with utterance. Uh, he won't, uh, you might not know what you're praying for, but that Spirit knows what you need. And then this woman gets delivered from drugs because God came searching for her. You see, and in our text, you read about two groups of people. You read about the Jews and the Gentiles. And we find that the, the uh, uh, message had went out to the Jews, <coughs> and God used that Jewish nation in a great way. And you don't see very many Gentiles, but it talks about a people who wasn't seeking after me. It talks about a people who didn't know me as a God. And uh, he says, I went after them. He said, uh, I went seeking them. And he's talking about us, the Gentile world. And he went out seeking, and that makes the Jews jealous. And so that's where we find the jealousy down through here. You know, so let's read a few verses as we're talking about this. Uh, but in Titus 1, 3, it says, But have in due time manifested his word through preaching. We're talking about preaching, which is uh, committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. I like the fact that he calls God his Savior in that particular text. If you were to read down, probably I think it's about two more verses, he calls Jesus Christ Savior. So who's our Savior, God or Jesus Christ? Doesn't make any difference. One, one the same, isn't it? <laughs> one the same, and he's trying to show you that uh, in that text. And so we find uh, all through the Bible you'll see the deity of Christ pop up as it's used through the Bible in different, different senses. But here, what we wanted to get out of this is that the Word is that, that in, in due time manifests His Word through preaching. In other words, He made His Word known. Made His Word known through the voices of many. And we always refer back to, like we say, you know, what's women, what, what should women be allowed to do in the church? I think women should be allowed to do whatever their pastor lets them do. The only thing the Bible forbids, forbids is the woman to usurp authority over the man. See, the, wo the man, <coughs> the woman, <coughs> the man's supposed to rule over the woman, the woman over the family, and, of course, Christ over the man, and that kind of thing. <coughs> and that's the way God set it up in the beginning. And so the church is set up just like the family. And so in the church, the woman is in subjection to the man because the woman is the weaker vessel. And they don't like to hear that, but it's true. So in the majority, the woman's going to be the weaker vessel. And that's one of the things we have against men competing with women. These guys that are guys that want to dress up like women and, and go into women's sports and compete. Well, you can take a lot weaker guy to go against the stronger women and still beat them because the man's built different. He's designed different inside. And, and so it's not fair for the women at all, not fair for all. Even though you have a, an extraordinary woman like Kate, Kate and Clark uh, play basket, plays basketball for the University of Iowa, and she just broke everybody's record out there. 
including Pistol Pete, Maravich's record, a scoring record. But even at that, uh, it would have, in order to say they really did, you'd had to play on, against the same teams, you know, men teams instead of women teams and so forth and so on. You know, it's a lot tougher playing against men than it is the women team. So it, if you're just watching them, it may not seem so, but the, whim, the men are really physical, you know, and it's really hard. And a lot of those guys, if they really wanted to play like they do against the guys, Caitlin Clark would be picking herself up off the ground a lot. You know, she wouldn't be shooting those shots like she is. And, and you've got these six foot seven, six foot eight guys just banging the ball back down in your face, you know. So, I mean, to say that that record's really been broke, yeah, it's been broke with point-wise, but it, it's not the same competition, guys. It's just, a, it, it's different. <coughs> yeah, it's, it's women. Yeah, it's, a, it's that way. And uh, <coughs> not, not saying, I mean, uh, a lot of women are smarter than me and a lot of women sharper than me and a lot of women can outdo me in a lot of areas, <coughs> but I didn't set it up. God did. You know, <clears throat> so I can't say. You no, know, even if I wanted to change it, I wouldn't have the right to change it. <laughs> uh, even if all the men turned wimpy, started wearing pink shirts and long hair, you know. <laughs> so uh, we, you know, and, and and the women started getting more masculine and, and growing beards and <laughs> mustaches and well, it still wouldn't be. God still said, you know, that's how he set it up, and we can't, we don't want to mess with that, you know, it's like changing the word of God, can't do that. Uh, so we find here that, but when it comes to this case, and we go back, and we see, you know, it was really back then, like, even in the synagogues, women couldn't worship like men. There was a certain place the women could go, they weren't allowed to say anything, you know, um, they could pray. But they had to pray, had, had their heads covered and all kinds of things, stipulations in their, in their prayer life. But, you know, when the Lord appeared, you know who the first person was to, that the Lord gave marching orders to to go back and to preach to the apostles about he's risen? It was Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene, uh, you know, she was delivered of seven evil spirits. And she wasn't a really good, good lady most of her life. She was a prostitute. In that movie, Cabarini, a prostitute's one of the people who helps that nun. And uh, it'll get you. Yeah, it'll get you. <clears throat> so God used women. He can use women. He used uh, Aquila and Priscilla. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and a lot of the women in the church, and he'd say, you know, um, you know, honor uh, Fofi or honor, I can't think of women's names. But anyway, you, you, you find these, these ones that Paul mentions in the church that help people, that help leaders, that help preachers, and so forth and so on. So it's not that women are forbidden. So when you're talking about the beautiful feet, it's not just talking about preachers or evangelists or missionaries. It's talking about each and every one of us, men and women alike. Even children can do that. And I think God wants us to open up and God wants us to make ourselves available, not only for your benefit to get out and get the gospel to exalt him, but that he can use you to answer someone else's prayer. Someone is there needing you. And uh, there may be someone praying right now and says like, uh, dear Lord, uh, I, I need something right now. I got to have, have, have something, Lord. You got to help me. I'm going to die right here. And then you may be the very one that God says, listen, we got to get him here. We got to get her there. At that particular time, that woman might not need a man. I think it would have been a lot better off the one I just told you about, Diane, that if a, a woman would have went there and witnessed to her. You know what I'm saying? But if there's no woman, woman available, then God will use what he has. Hey, honestly, that was bad. But I went to, I went to a house where the woman answered naked. 
They answer the door naked. <laughs> Ken Fountain still talks about it. <laughs> Brother Ken said, I ran off and left him. <laughs> He's standing there at the door not knowing what to do. I went to across the hall to the other door. <laughs> and she got behind the door, but he told me, I never seen her. I just seen her behind the door. He said she came to the door wide open. And then she stepped behind the door when I I walked over. But then I turned around and left Ken to him by himself. <laughs> and Ken was he's like, ah <laughs> But you never know what's gonna happen out there. That's why we go what? Two by two. Amen. That's why you go two by two. God sent them out two by two. And we never, as a church, we never send people by themselves. We will always want you to have a helper. <clears throat> and you're always going to need a helper. And that's because, and usually we match up two women with two women and men with men. Now, Jehovah Witness, they don't care how they send them out. But if you put men and women together, it's not going to be long before they get talked about. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> so you don't want to do that. You want, you want to match women with women, men with men. Make them available. We always pray before we go because we want God to use us in the way he needs to use us. And let God set your, your, your calls that night, your divine appointments that he's going to bring you out there. And if that calls out there for you, you'll know it one day. You might not realize it then. Then you'll get to thinking about it and say, man, I was the only one who could help her, really. I knew all about that stuff. And that's how it works. <clears throat> So here, I better, we better get down through here a minute. Um, we're talking about the beautiful feet of, of those who preach the gospel. And, and that's us. And all through the Bible, it's like that. And verse 16 says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Elias said, Lord, who has believed our report? Who has believed our report? <clears throat> In Acts 1.8 it says, but ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea, all Judea, and in Samaria and to the othermost parts of the world. And so when we have our missionaries here, and we get to hear their stories, how they take the gospel into all these different parts of the world. One of the countries I never wanted to go to because it, it has such a bad reputation was Colombia. You know, Americans, you know, you got to be really careful in, a, in a Columbia because understand it that they like to kidnap Americans and hold them for a ransom. And so it's a it's really open criminal kind of country and a lot of drugs down there and drug lords and all those things. And, and pretty much um, the way I understand it, and I hate to say it because I don't know it from person, but the police are bought off for a lot of times, you know, and, <clears throat> and they don't really help. So, uh, but when I hear someone down there starting Bible colleges, you know, something just stirs up in me. That's what it's going to take to change a country like that. They got Catholicism, it ain't working. They need, they need Jesus. And that's the only thing that will ever work. It's, um, you know, let's let Jesus get into the drug lords, get into that group and see what happens. Let people start getting said. Let a revival break out in Cambodia or um, Colombia and see what happens. You know? Uh, it, it, it will change the country. It changed this one in the Reformation. <clears throat> uh, we go back and we, we, we see the, the great resets, they call them, uh, where God took over and started revivals and things changed. And that's what God does. <clears throat> in uh, 1 Corinthians one twenty one, it says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So it was the preaching or the proclaiming of the message of God, which we're talking about, because when you see a faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, he's talking about the gospel message. So once you, they hear the word of God, basically, about, you know, this message, uh, what God said he would do, 
if you do this, if you believe on him and you trust him, God's going to do this, then that, that believing sets in. And then uh, unless they hear that message, you know, they may never believe. They may never, never have the opportunity to believe on the Lord. And so then God, I don't know what all the realm that God would deal for people who never had an opportunity, but it's hard to believe that in our day and age people don't have the opportunity especially in America. America is going to be like Sidon. <laughs> you know, if all the things were done here that was done uh, in Sidon, <clears throat> they would have repented a long time ago. And they're going to say all the things that were done in America, it better have been done in Papua New Guinea or, you know, New Zealand or some of these uh, uh, islands or these places far out. Uh, they would have repented a long time ago. Americans just buck their nose up and keep walking. <clears throat> I seen this guy, he was, this video, this guy was offering people money just to tell him a verse, a Bible verse. I'll give you $20 if you can give me a Bible verse. No, no, get away. I'm not into that. We're not religious. We don't want nothing to do. That's what people were doing to him. Finally, he ran, ran into a guy, mind me of Johnny. <laughs> And that guy said, a Bible verse? I'll give you a whole bunch of them. How many $20 bills you got? <laughs> and boy, and then he let him have it. But you know how long it took to find a guy like that? A long time. Long time, yeah. That's sad. That means we're not doing a very good job. We're not doing a very good job. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.10 says, But it's now made manifest... The uh, by our, the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. There you go. Now we had God our Savior. Now we got Jesus Christ our Savior. Savior Jesus Christ who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So we see through this gospel message, we've got life and we've got immortality, eternal life. Or everlasting, we should say. Uh, we have eternal life because the eternal one lives in us. But you have everlasting life because you had a beginning. <clears throat> but when you talk about God, he has no beginning, no ending, so he's eternal. And so when we talk about us and eternal life, yeah, we have the eternal life in Christ, but we have everlasting life, everlasting life. <coughs> the only difference. Uh, Isaiah 53, 1. You see, if you, in verse 16, when it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah say, Lord, who has believed our report? But in Isaiah, he's quoting from Isaiah 30, uh, 53, 1. Who has believed our report, and who is, who is the arm of the Lord revealed? Isaiah said that some 800 years before Christ, and Paul, Paul was re-quoting that, uh, as a prophecy to what's going on now and what was going on in the time of, of the Apostle Paul, that the message was going out, but who's believed our report? How would you like to be like some of those guys, like Jeremiah, for instance, for I don't know how many years he preached, he never had a convert. And Isaiah was the same way, you know, all these, he's preaching to all these nations about the judgment of God and everything, and Nobody's listening. Nobody's listening. He said they got ears to hear, but they don't hear. They got eyes to see, but they don't see. And so God has to, I'm sure God has to do something in our heart. And in our day and age, we have an advantage. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit comes in us. And they never had that advantage. It would come on them, but it didn't come in them. And so... Uh, that advantage is that, that gives us an extra witness. That's that voice you hear inside of you that's saying, uh huh. And when you're witnessing somebody, I'm witnessing to them on the outside. God, through the Spirit's witness to him on the inside, and the Word of God is the third witness. And so we're sitting here giving them the Word from this witness. I'm witnessing. It actually happened to me, happened to all my friends, it happened to a lot of people I know. And it's going to happen to you, too, if you listen to that little voice inside of you and say, that preacher knows what he's talking about. You better listen to him. That little voice is the one that's telling you. And sometimes they'll fight that thing tooth and nail. I know he's right, but 
I just can't give up what I got. You don't understand what I'm into. I said, well, I, I don't have to understand, you know, and get him to help you. Give your heart to him and let him help you in this. And, I, and that's what you got to do. You got to trust the Lord. Give it to him and let him lead you and guide you in those steps to get things straightened out. So when you look at um, Hebrews 4, 2, it says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as it was unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in uh, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Uh, you see, he says, but the word preached did not profit them because they didn't have it mixed with, there was no faith. They didn't have something that you need to believe. And I think it's the Spirit. And um, that Spirit, that's where prayer comes in. When you start to pray for somebody, God sends that spirit in advance. He sets them up. They're waiting on you, God, in that spirit. It's kind of like uh, when Noah built the ark, God says, now get your family and come on into the ark. Why was God asking them to come in? Because he was already in there. See? God's already there when you show up. And he's saying, come on, come on in. Come on. And so that witnessing starts, and God didn't leave you on your own. He's there witnessing with you through the person of the Spirit. And so that's a, a great theological thought, I should say, that is revealed when you see all the people through the Bible that God dealt with. Look at Cornelius. Uh, look at the Philippian jailer. Look at uh, 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 the eunuch uh, that Philip got in. I mean, God was already witnessing to them, and they're reading the Bible, and they're being talked to, and before the preacher ever showed up. And then the preacher shows up and says, understand what thou readest? How can I understand? Let somebody show me. Here comes that preacher. <laughs> Here comes that preacher. And boy, Philip jumped up there and started preaching the same scripture he was reading from Isaiah and preached unto him Jesus. There's that witness. There's that witness. And, and that's, what the, that's what it's all about. And that confessing is something we should all do. Uh, constantly confess Christ to our friends and our neighbor and every chance we get in. But you need, you need to set a time to go to do it. To do it. We used to have what we called the foster club. Now Nancy could tell you all about the foster club because she was in it. It was for women, a soul winning group for women. And the women would get together and they would go out on Saturday soul winning. And they were very, very successful. Women can be more successful than men because people will feel easier to talk to a woman than they do a man. Why that is, I don't know, but I'm the same way. I could talk to a woman easier than I could talk to a man for whatever the reason is. I just. <laughs> Seems like uh, uh, maybe because women are good talkers. <laughs> and I don't have to say much because they'll do most of the talking. <laughs> but, yeah, they, ha they, uh, they would go out and do that. They'd have a great time. And they run into all kinds of uh, strange things out there. And one time they were in Milford and they were in this trailer park and they parked the van. They all go together, and they, they, they would canvas this trailer park. They'd all go two by two, and everybody hit their own, own uh, trailers. And, and so they come back to the van, and somebody wrote on the side of the van, "What was it, Nan? About the devil?" Satan is alive and well. That's what they wrote on the van. Satan is alive and well. He, Satan didn't like that. <laughs> he was stirred up. He was getting mad. And he was going to let them know, I'm still here. Don't you think you're going to pull anything on me? But uh, 
He that's in you is greater than he is in the world. And he will have to flee. All you do is use the word. That's all you have to do. And the devil will flee from you eventually. So here we find in, in uh, Deuteronomy 23, 21, they have moved me with jealousy. So he tells uh, uh, the Israelites that uh, he's jealous. He said they moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And then, uh, and I will move them to jealousy with uh, those which are not my, which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. So here he's saying that, yeah, you're, you're, you, you provoke me to jealousy, uh, going after these false gods and these vanities, but I'm going to provoke you. So the reason today that we're in this thing is because God used the church to make Israel jealous. Because God wants Israel back. And until Israel sees that God's doing something greater in someone else, a nation that knew not him, than in them, then God's going to, you know, basically come back after them and, and take them back. But they're going to repent and they're going to come back to God and say, Oh, God, we're your people. Come for us. And that will happen in the tribulation. That will happen in the middle. <coughs> Isaiah 65, 1 says, I, have, I, have, I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Be, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. You see, God's talking about us Gentiles. And, and it's funny that Paul can use, he can use uh, basically millennial verses too and apply them to the church. And uh, when we talk about making application, Paul, can, Paul made a lot of application from Old Testament Scripture and from a millennial scripture from the Old Testament uh, dealing with another time period. In uh, 65 2, he says, Isaiah 65 2, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walketh in a way which was not good after their own thoughts. Romans 10 18 says, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sounds went into all the earth and their words unto the end of the world. Have they not heard? Yes, they've heard. Have they not heard? Oh, yes. Uh, it's been there. They heard about it. They heard about uh, the good message of God, that God's come to save them. In Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. So here we find the gospel of the kingdom. So you find that a lot of the gospels are not all gospels of grace. And, uh, but, God, but Paul can use those to represent what God's doing with the church because the church is doing what Israel was supposed to be doing. Israel was supposed to be evangelizing this world, but uh, instead, God turned to the church, which you, you, you never see in the Old Testament. It's there. It's mentioned. The thought's there. You can see it that way, but not by name. Not by name. And it's kind of like uh, someone said, uh, I, I laugh at people who argue on things they don't know nothing about. And uh, this guy said, ah, they, these dispensationalists, they can't even find the word dispensation in the Bible. I said, what? It's found four times in the New Testament, Brother Scott. Dispensation is four times in the New Testament. <coughs> so here's a guy arguing about something he knew nothing about. And, uh, and if you confront him, he says, that's that King James Bible. And I said, well, if you get you a Bible, you'd know what it's all about, wouldn't you? I said, the only thing wrong with you, you don't have a right Bible. And you can't find it. If you ain't got the right Bible, you may never find it. So... Uh, and that's what it means. I mean, preach means to proclaim a certain message. Dispensation means to dispense. Dispense what God's given you to, to share out. 
And so in each time that God uses something uh, different, then that's called a dispensation because God's given us a mystery. Uh, uh, in our age, it's called a mystery, Paul said. And as he said, God gave this to me that I can give to you. And we're going to have to stop right here on verse number 19 because it's getting late. So let's stop here. Any questions? I thought we'd get through this. We might just go on chapter 11 anyhow. Let me read this down real quick. It says this, But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by the foolish nation I will anger you. Yeah, they knew. Moses told them that. Look at Isaiah in 20. He says, but Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hand unto a, unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. And you see, uh, uh, through the rest of this particular chapter, he's just saying you've been warned, you've been told the message is out there. You're just a stiff-necked people. You're just a, a gainsaying people. You just, uh, he's really rebuking them, basically. And then we'll get in chapter 11 where he, he turns it around and he says, but I got a remnant. But all of Israel will be, all Israel will be saved. But, he says. So any questions? War Room? War Room. Did you watch that? Did you become a fan of it? You ever seen War Room? Go home and watch it. Is it on Netflix? It's on there somewhere. I've seen it. No. It's called, it's, just, it's about a woman and her prayer life. Really. And it's, it's good for marriages. It's good for, because it's a struggling family and their marriage and, and someone starts praying for them. Amen. It's a powerful movie. Any other questions? Or let's be dismissed in prayer. Anybody want to dismiss us? Go ahead, John.